It goes down the drain. It goes through 1,800 miles because it includes sewage coming from our suburban jurisdictions to the Blue Plains, what I consider a water recycling plant and we return over 300 million gallons of cleansed water every single day to the Potomac from whence it originally came. Now, I want to clarify here, I, previously I was the director of the District Department of the Environment. We are joined by Christophe Tulu. We are very lucky to have you. He's an excellent addition to service here in the district. While I was at the Department of Environment, I have many of my uh, prior colleagues with me behind me. We were very proud to have consolidated and coordinated the lead program for the district. What used to take five agencies of work, we narrowed to two. What used to be a responsive system, we waited till a child was poisoned by lead until we could act. Now is a proactive system where we can go out and test and monitor and act in areas where we think we're, there may be a problem before it happens. That's been a very positive step, and I know that has continued under uh, Director Tolu's uh, leadership at the Department of Environment. I had the great pleasure of joining what is now DC Water in October of 2009. I believe that addressing the threat of lead in drinking water is one of our absolute top priorities. Make no mistake, lead in water is a public health problem, and we must be active in its solution. The, problem, the issues of 2000 to 2004 severely undermined customer confidence in our system and our enterprise. And it's up to us to demonstrate that there should once again be DC water here on this table and everywhere else. Because I would argue it is cleaner than what we know is in this bottle. But I need you to believe that more than I need me to believe that. The recent investigation and studies about CDC suggest that these problems still linger. Most important to us that lead in water and lead as a threat is preventable. This is a problem we can solve. And this enterprise that I've joined and I'm pleasure to be part of is committed. What about our responses? Initially in 2002, it's been mentioned about the partial lead service replacement. That was not an optional program. That was a required action by the United States Environmental Protection Agency under the lead and copper rule. We were required to replace 7% of the public service lines in any given year. The question has always been partial service line replacements. As information has come forward, we determined, really all of us, that partial lead service line replacements not only does not drop lead in the system long, in the long term, in the short term can actually cause a spike in lead in the water. In fact, because when the lead lines are replaced, there's a lot of agitation to the pipes themselves, which can dislodge lead into the system and cause a surge. So as lead in the water, in fact, was reduced because of the change to orthophosphate in 2004, it became clear that we were no longer required to do partial lead service line replacements. So we have eliminated that program where we were doing more than several thousand partial lead service line replacements in a year. They are still done in the several hundreds in a year. But I want to emphasize there are no lead service lines that are replaced for that reason on the partial basis. When a water main is replaced in the street, the, the lines that come from our customers are no longer the right length because the water main is not put in exactly the same place. Some will be too long, others will be too short. So we replace those lines not because they're lead, they just don't fit the system. So we put new lines in. In some cases, if the older line was a lead line that has the effect of being a partial lead service line replacement, that's not why it's done. However, in those situations, we communicate with that customer six months in advance. We provide ample information we believe about what risk there is involved. We offer to do a full lead line replacement and will offer funding to lower income residents. And, and as a final, we will provide free uh, water lead, certified for lead removal, water filters for those customers for at least six months or until the lead numbers have gone down below the 15 part action level. So we have changed our response and are being very proactive in our protections for our customers. Thanks so much. Thank you. Mr. Tulu, you're now recognized for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Ranking Member Chaffetz and my Congresswoman, uh, Ms. Holmes. And thank you very much for this opportunity to testify before you today. My name is Christophe Tulu. I am the Acting Director of the District Department of the Environment, commonly known as DDOE. Uh, lead is among our most nefarious environmental toxins. Uh, it, is, it steals our most valued treasure, our children's potential. Because of that, there is no safe level of lead in children's blood, and I can assure you that getting lead out of their bodies and their environment 
is a top priority for Mayor Adrian Fenty and for DDOE. I'd like to take a moment to reflect back on the period 2000 to 2003 and DC's lead and water crisis. As you know, the House Science Committee subcommittee uh, recently completed a report that questioned the discrepancy between the number of blood lead screenings in 2003 and the numbers in adjacent years. Prior to that report, DDOE undertook its own rigorous review of the data to determine the extent to which children with elevated blood levels might have slipped through the cracks. I'm pleased to say that we did receive those screening reports and most importantly determined that the overwhelming majority of children with elevated blood levels did, in, and did indeed receive district services. Originally, we determined that 10 children had blood levels above 15 micrograms per deciliter who may have not have been tracked, but after further analysis, we found that five had either received the service, did not need the service because their blood levels indeed were not elevated, or actually their, um, uh, their levels have been recorded in our lead track to database. Nonetheless, uh, we inspected all 10 properties involved, notified owners that failed inspection, and we've given those folks 30 days to correct the violations. Much has happened since 2003. Most importantly, uh, in 2008, Mayor Fenty signed into law a nation-leading measure that makes prevention of lead poisoning a front-burner district policy, building on our efforts to respond effectively to high le levels when we find them. The district's new lead law, which has been implemented for just over a year now, creates a vigorous new enforcement program that, among other things, makes chipping and peeling paint in a pre-1978 home a presumptive lead hazard enforceable by DDOE, thus shifting the burden to the landlord to prove that deteriorating conditions are safe. The law consolidates lead enforcement in one agency, that is DDOE, allowing quick action when a hazard is identified. And it requires landlords to test their property for lead hazards and document the property as cleared before renting that property to a tenant who is pregnant or who has children under the age of six. DDOE is also expanding its complaint response for reports of unsafe work practices and property conditions. It is minimizing data problems, right? requiring testing labs to submit their results. Mr. Tulu, uh, could you? I'm not sure what happened to your audio there, but we're we're losing you. Can you uh, pull I'm, that microphone? I'm back in there service. All right. Okay. Thank you. We are also joining two other jurisdictions around the country to include water testing as part of its follow-up investigation of a poisoned child's home, allowing inspectors to advise parents on ways to reduce risk from lead in the water supply. We are also reaching out to families with children whose blood levels are below the usual action level of 10 micrograms per deciliter, and in this case between five and nine, to teach them how to reduce home lead levels. We're targeting proactively the highest risk areas around the city for enforcement. So for example, if a child with an elevated blood level lives in a multifamily property, the owner manager of that property is contacted to ensure that lead-based, to ensure lead-based compliance for all their units. We're collaborating with local Medicaid officials on data sharing to ensure that Medicaid children are screened for lead poisoning on time, a strategy that has, that has led to double-digit jumps in screening rates in other jurisdictions. We're participating in monthly meetings with community members and multiple district agencies to find and implement better ways to prevent lead poisoning. And finally, the agency is strengthening its relationship with the district's office of the Attorney General, resulting in greater focus on and stronger actions against those who violate the law. In closing, the district's leadership on lead issues is truly a community effort, ranging from concerned parents to knowledgeable and passionate advocates and enlightened city council members and an engaged and forceful mayor. And of course, a team of expert and committed DDOE staff, several of whom are with me today, for whom this is not only a mission, but also their life's work. Thank you again for this opportunity. I'll be glad to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Dr. Silbergeld, you're now welcome to make an opening statement for five minutes. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the invitation to provide testimony on this topic and on the broader context in which this topic arises, as has been noted. I am Professor of Environmental Health Sciences, Environmental Health Engineering, and Epidemiology, 
at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health in Baltimore, but I am appearing as a private citizen. I want to cover three specific topics. Our current understanding of the health hazards of lead to young children and others, the contribution of lead in drinking water to exposures and toxicity, and the importance of interventions after exposure to mitigate toxicity to children. As you know, there's extensive scientific consensus now that lead is associated with significant risks to health at blood lead levels well below the guidance level set by CDC in 1991, some 20 years ago. For adults, there are also significant health impacts of exposures below 10, and I want to stress this, that it's very important to extend our public health purview to adults in light of the serious health effects of lead exposure that occur after childhood. For children, we know that these exposures are associated with problems in neurodevelopment in children, but in adults, they are associated with increased risks of cardiovascular disease, including increased risks of death due to stroke uh, at the same levels. We also recognize that lead-induced impairments in neurodevelopment in children that are measured early in life are followed by highly significant risks expressed in adolescents and young adults, which speaks to the importance of intervention. Lead exemplifies, in terms of drinking water, lead exemplifies the importance of cumulative risk, that is, the importance of considering all exposures in evaluating the significance of any specific exposure. In fact, as our understanding of lead toxicity increases, we really are impelled to reevaluate guidelines and standards for all media and all potential sources of lead. For example, it has been calculated that a child drinking two liters of water per day at the current action level of 15 parts per billion would exceed a blood lead level of five micrograms per deciliter within a year under conditions of frequent consumption. Thus, we, moreover, if we accept the conclusions of research on the toxicity of lead and reset our health guidance to, two five, to five micrograms per deciliter or lower, we can no longer assume that housing is the main source of elevated lead exposures. And the risk metric that has been developed by CDC and by a committee that I was part of is no longer reliable for preventing lead exposure or even prioritizing preventive actions. As you may know, EPA is currently recognizing the importance of reconsidering many standards and guidance related to environmental concentrations of lead, most recently with the National Ambient Air Quality uh, Standards for Lead in Air. I was a member of the SAB panel for EPA that reviewed the scientific justification for the current drinking water standard. The enforceable standard was set at 15 parts per billion, but it is my scientific opinion that given what we know now, this current standard is not acceptable. Nor is the current strategy for intermittent sampling, and most certainly the recommendations to consumers that flushing the water line will prevent exposure to drinking water lead, an acceptable way to prevent exposure. Now on the last point in terms of interventions, lamentably, many children in the United States, particularly but not only in our nation's capital, as well as in other major cities, including my own, continue to be exposed to lead. Thus, we cannot ignore the importance of considering interventions that can mitigate the short and long-term impacts of these unprevented exposures. Clinical and experimental researchers have examined the efficacy of educational and behavioral interventions for children expressing the characteristic impairments of lead toxicity including neurocognitive delays, impulsivity, attention deficit disorder, and heightened aggressiveness. Some of this research has been conducted by my colleagues at Hopkins, such as the Kennedy Krieger School. In fact, this is an approach that's been adopted by parents and in school systems, and in fact is one of the focal points of the CDC lead poisoning program, that is, the delivery of interventions to children with elevated lead exposures and I am a member of the advisory committee for the CDC that considers this topic. This is a very important response, and if we fail to meet the needs of lead-exposed children, 
This will increase the risks of school failure, learning disabilities, and sociopathic behaviors in the next generation of young adults. Thank you for your attention, and I'm ready to answer any questions that I can. Thank you, Doctor. I now yield myself five minutes for a first uh, round of questioning. Uh, Ms. Arias, thank you very much for your willingness. I know you had to pinch hit at the last minute when uh, uh, your, uh, the director, Dr. Frieden, was out of the country, and I appreciate your testimony here today. Uh, to begin, you mentioned in your testimony uh, that as a result of the lessons learned during the 2000 to 2004 lead in the water crisis, that uh, the Center for Disease Control instituted an automated, automated surveillance reporting system and require that all data be reported directly to CDC. I must confess I was not in place at that time, and I, I'm, I'm curious to know how much of a, a change that, uh, that presented to what was going on previously, and uh, how is that working today, and, and uh, can you point to any uh, enhancements or changes that might bring improvement to that whole system? Uh, thank you very much for that question. The system is not fully implemented yet. We, uh, we are expecting that by the end of December of this year, we'll have 15 programs who are submitting their information in a very timely basis directly to CDC. And by timely, I mean quarterly reports as opposed to reports uh, on an annual basis and maybe even longer than that, that unfortunately in the past had the potential, as it did in D.C., leading to a lag between what was going on in a jurisdiction and our knowledge of it to be able to intervene. In addition to the fact that it's coming, the, the information is coming in directly to CDC and more quickly, it's also coming in in raw form so that we are actually doing the analyses as opposed to having the local programs do the analysis of the data and then submit those summary results to us. Uh, what that means is that we, again, will have the raw numbers more quickly and available to detect any significant changes in a jurisdiction that may require a significant response. Well, let me ask you, what, what data are you actually collecting? What we're collecting are uh, the results of testing of the, of the water and then the blood levels in, in children that are being tested primarily. And so what we're interested in tracking is, are there any changes then that are being reported or that are being detected in blood levels uh, of kids who are being tested in those areas? And let me ask you further, the, the level, there's been a number of uh, witnesses uh, on the panel as well that have talked about the standard, uh, how many how many parts per billion, and there's some direct uh, testimony that the old standard should be revised to recognize a, a greater danger, and that uh, the, the, the old standard, is it 15? Is it 15 parts In per billion? In the water, 15 parts per billion, yes. And that that, that was, I think, uh, Dr. Silbergeld, Silbergeld uh, testified that uh, that was unacceptable, if I can quote you. Uh, are we still testing at that 15 parts per billion level, which was, I think, instituted back in the 90s? We are testing at that level. There are two levels that are of particular concern to the CDC. One is the level in the water, and then the other is the blood level as well, so the okay. 10 micrograms per deciliter. One of the things that we are going to be, and, and Dr. Frieden has already charged the leadership of the National Center for Environmental Health and ATSDR to work with the Advisory Committee on Lead to revisit both of those levels. In the case of the 15 per um, billion, it's a recommendation that we would make to EPA and others, uh, and then they would have to essentially take that information and make the final recommendation of what it is that, uh, what the standard ought to be. Uh, in the case of the sort of level of concern of blood levels, we are again sort of going to work with the advisory committee to determine, number one, what is the best language to use so that we do not confuse people and misrepresent or lead to confusion about the fact that no level of lead is safe. Uh, right. And so we're working on both of those. Given the, the timing of this, we're talking about uh, the, the crisis that was identified as 2000 to 2004. Uh, I also understand that you're, you're only testing uh, children until age six. Is there a, uh, at least that's what I read, if that's not the fact, you can, you can, you can educate me on that. Given the nature of the problem here in D.C. in the long time period, and we're still not getting uh, full compliance with the reporting requirements, 
wouldn't it be helpful to continue the testing beyond age six for, to, to catch maybe some children beyond that age that might have been exposed earlier? The, the recommendations speak to those ages because they are at highest risk for the negative health consequences of exposure to lead. However, uh, CDC would be supportive of testing all kids to make sure that all kids are equally protected from exposure to lead uh, and not just those who are at highest risk along with pregnant women and women who may be breastfeeding because of the infant issues. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. I notice my time has expired. I now recognize the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Chaffetz, for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Ms. Arias, I, 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 sorry, that's going to ring a few times just means that we've got some votes. Um, are you familiar with this, uh, the, the report by the majority staff of the Subcommittee on Investigations and Oversight of the Committee of Science and Technology, Subcommittee Chairman Brad Miller? Yes, I am. Dated uh, May 20th, 2010. This is such a damning report on, uh, I mean, it, it's pretty shocking the accusations that they throw around in here and, and the, the uh, how inept the, the CDC was. What's, your res what's the response to this report? Uh, as follow-up to today, we can provide you a more detailed sort of account and side-by-side -side of what was in the report and then the actions that we took either prior or in response to the criticisms that have been raised to improve uh, our work. One of the things, in general, I think it is the case that we are, we regret the fact that we did not become knowledgeable of the situation in D.C. Uh, any earlier than we did. However, what we have been very clear about is how we are still confident of the response that we had when we did become aware of the issue, that it was an appropriate response, it was an adequate response, and it was a response that maximized the safety of children and all yep. others in the home at that time. Sorry, my time's so short. I've got to, I've got to kind of move from subject to subject here. Well, this is page two. The CDC cannot produce the raw data used in the cross-sectional study. Both CDC and the district government claim they have no records containing the raw scientific data to substantiate the basis for this study. The cross-sectional study was not a CDC study. The longitudinal one was. Uh, both studies were presented in the same dispatch in the MMWR, and so we never had the data for the cross sectional study. We have tried to get those in order to um, uh, look at the analyses that were done and compare and see if uh, they were accurate, but okay, we me, do not me. have that. The subcommittee's investigation has found that the number of D.C. children with elevated blood levels in 2002 and 2003 was at least three times greater than the CDC claimed in 2004. Is that accurate? That's on the basis of the cross-sectional data? That's on the CDC failed to provide reliable public health guidance when it published the emergency dispatch based on known missing data. Uh, I'll have to provide you with follow-up information because there are a number of different discrepancies that have been alluded to or that have been pointed out in that report. Um, and so I'll have to look into the exact one that you're referring to and get you that information and follow-up. Yeah, part of it, it says later on page 8, there was a mysterious drop of almost 6,000 in the number of children tested in 2003 to compare to, two th to the year 2000. In the longitudinal study that, DC, I mean, that CDC did conduct, uh, we did find that there were a number of cases that were missing. Uh, we have since collected that information and done the reanalyses to be able to provide more accurate information. All of that information has been then corrected uh, in the MMWR and all of the materials that CDC makes available to the public and other professionals. In the conclusion of this report, it is, quote, it is inexplicable that the CDC, the nation's premier public health agency, promoted as credible a report that countered every single piece of research that outside scientists the agency and its own advisor committee had previously issued on the dangers of elevated lead levels, and it continues on. I, I it can't get any more aggressive in saying how bogus this is. I, I, I guess we don't have time to go through the details of this, but this certainly warrants a very thorough explanation and a side-by-side -side analysis. If you're willing to provide that, we would appreciate it. The, the contrast in what you're saying um, and what this report says is is huge. This is not like one little minor difference here. It mm -hmm. basically says the whole report is something that we shouldn't believe in. And we'll provide uh, that to you. Thank mm -hmm. you. I, I appreciate that. And, and, and Mr. Hawkins, uh, welcome. like the new logo. I'll get a, one of those patches for my suit, I guess. If that's Say the word. word. There we go. All right. Just you said I'll it. call you. Okay. I'll call you. Yeah. Uh, um, 
Uh, let me ask you here. There was, a, there was an analysis done um, where there were 20 different recommendations. Can you give me a sense of how thorough these recommendations have been implemented? This was back from the uh, report from uh, Eric Holder. This is, uh, sorry, this is a uh, summary of the investigation reported to the Board of Directors of the District of Columbia, Wa District of Columbia Water and Sewer Authority, July 16, 2004. There were 20 recommendations. Have they been implemented, not implemented? Um, I, I will have to get to you about specifically, because we can answer one through 20 exactly what we have done uh, on each. In short, uh, the Water and Sewer Authority, which, by the way, the legal name has not changed, so that is still the name. This is just as DC Waters as we're doing it's our marketing. business. It's marketing. I can appreciate it. Yeah. Um, has adopted a very aggressive strategy across the board. So the partial lead service line replacements, as I've mentioned, was a required step. We, in fact, are doing advanced uh, monitoring. Any one of our customers that's concerned about lead in the water can ask for a testing kit, which we will send them. We will analyze the results. If there are results that indicate that- Will you that send me one of those? We will send you one of those as I well. I would love to see the water that's coming out of the sink in my office, what that looks like. That okay, would we would be delighted. Send and we would, if there's an issue, we will also advise you on what steps to take in response. Oh, as I'll, I'll believe me, I'll call you. From soup to nuts. <laughs> That'd be great. Um, the monitoring that we do, in fact, because because we have been under the action level at 15 parts per billion, we could seek from EPA to reduce the level of monitoring that we're required to do. We have not done that. We think the expanded level of monitoring that you put in place when there's a problem is warranted to continue because we want to make sure we can demonstrate to our customers that which we believe is true but want to show, make sure the numbers demonstrate. You can see the water monitoring that we do on our website, so we release the monitoring that is done. We are working with advocates to look at all of our materials and communications to make sure that that which we're describing to the customer is true or is, is as careful and as carefully worded as possible. As I mentioned on partial lead service line replacements, if we believe there's an issue in your home, we will provide you with the certified lead removal uh, uh, filters for your home for at least six months or until we're both convinced that the numbers have gone below the action levels. We work with the aqueduct to make sure that from the distribution system on research, this is board initiated as well with the support of the enterprise. In last year, end of last year, we did our own research that revealed a connection between lead in water and galvanized pipes. That's something we did on our own. We released to the public and are taking steps. So one for one on the Holder Report, uh, we can ab absolutely go one for one. But the, the story is, this is a serious question. We uh, There is more research to be done to know what the level is the right number. In our view, this, the statement the Chair said from the beginning, the only good lead is no lead. And the question is, how can it be done in a cost-effective, thoughtful manner? It's a public health threat, and we want to be proactive in our response. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks, Madam Chair. I'll get back. Thank you very much, Mr. Chavis. Um, <clears throat> for reasons that are perfectly obvious, I'm, I'm taking the chair pending the full vote for the residents of the District of Columbia. It will come. Um, Dr. Arias, now, just to clear up uh, before we get to, to prevention, it's my understanding that the position of the CDC is the public misinterpreted the uh, 2004 mobility uh, weekly uh, findings. Um, now, if there was a misunderstanding, what steps has CDC taken uh, to clear up this misunderstanding? Uh, there, there are two sets of steps that have been taken. One is to address the information provided in that document, in that document, and how it is that then that information can be used, or how we're encouraging that it be used. And the other is what we're doing to rectify processes that led to those difficulties. Um, on the first hand, what we have done is again identify the information that was not available to us at that time, have gotten that information, and redone the analyses to make sure that the most accurate information is available. As a result of that, then, we have made all the corrections and have put special notices on all the documents in the MMWR and on our internet pages that uh, refer to the original uh, 2004 article and so have the corrected information there. We also then contacted all the lead programs in the country with the updated information to make sure that they understood uh, what the correct information was. Um, in terms of processes, again, what we're doing is improving those surveillance 
systems so that we do not find ourselves in a situation again where we find out about potential rate or actual increases in either water levels or blood levels of lead uh, from the media or accidentally after a long period of time of exposure so that we are making sure that we are aggressive both in collecting the information and then having the program work with the with the programs in the state and locals to make sure that the information is being submitted and that we then analyze it in a timely basis and act appropriately. Um, Mr. Hawkins, I have a question for you in light of Dr. Arias's testimony. First, 